ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Okay, let's try now, Bruce. Okay, what are we going to try now, Lionel? I think it's working now. Is it working now? The problem is when I go from one studio to the other, for some reason or other, there's something, some little thing that's slightly different. Oh, and, it's the electrons on this side of the board are a little bit different. Are they? No, I, I know what so. it that is. Must, I don't that, my, that must be it. I don't have my glasses on. Oh, well, there you go. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, your glasses on, you can see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fix your eyes, they said. It'll be better. You won't need glasses to see far. Great. Yeah. Now I can't see three feet in front of me. Oh, <laughs> there you go. So, Bruce, you know that guy uh, I speak of, I call him George the Goalie? George the Goalie, yes. I've uh, heard you talk of George the Goalie. George the Goalie. And we've talked to him before. It's uh, George yes, Bogotuck from uh, Soundtracks. Yes. And, we, own uh, the, we own the mountains of Colorado. Yes, and we haven't talked to him for a while. So oh. I thought, so I thought, let's get him in here and talk to him. And then, sure. uh, uh, and because I'm, uh, I've been struggling with the audio equipment, I don't feel much more like doing small talk. So let's get him in here and start talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get in here and get the show on the road before yeah, something else happens. Yeah, let's get in and get out while we can. That good plan. Um, hey, George, come on into the studio. Hello, guys. How are you? Fine. Um, did the Leafs win tonight? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you already I, told me, <laughs> and I recorded no, in that, in that, in it. In that, in that case, maybe they did. Yeah, and I left it two to one. So, and they look like oh, well, there you go. Well, so don't tell me if I, I will at least I have tell, something. I won't. I won't tell you anything more. Yeah, don't tell me if Marner got another point or anything like that. Uh, let me at yeah, least find that out for myself. I'll leave, I'll leave the rest up to you. Yeah, but I'll tell you that arena that, in Detroit's a fine looking arena. Uh, that's the new one. I haven't been to the new one yet. Yeah, I haven't been to the new one yet, but I know a couple guys have been there, and they say it's just absolutely spectacular. That's Motown. Motown. I actually think. That's, go ahead, George. I was just going to say, that's the, what, the new Little Caesars Arena, I think, isn't it? Yes, sir. And I think they missed the chance. They should have called it the oven. <laughs> that would have been perfect. maybe we're on to we're on to a new nickname here yeah that, the that, oven. that's what i thought you know everybody everybody's got a nickname that, like little caesar's reading well it, it's the oven the red wings are playing at the oven tonight yeah Come it's on. beautiful i love it you are a you are a nickname wizard you know that bruce you are a nickname wizard well thank you <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure that's going to do much for you i mean you could no, probably yeah, try open know, at this point in life of retirement now who cares but you, uh thank you, you you could open a youtube site and people could you know and you could go they could tell you this story and you could go yeah you come boom. up with a nickname yeah there yeah. you go i love that wouldn't that be a great nickname for the arena the detroit red wings arena the oven Man, oh, that's man. what I thought when the first open. Like, come on, you're missing it. You're missing it here. You call it the oven. Yeah, I know. Holy well, God. it fits. It fits because down in Dallas, the uh, uh, stars, the uh, American Airlines Center, they call it the hangar. There you yeah. go. So, why not the oven? How are, exactly. How, how are the stars doing t- this year? Uh, they're actually. I've been watching the games, wondering where this team came from because most of the team is the same from last year when they struggled and but didn't get out of the first round. And uh, really kind of played around in mediocrity the last five years, except for when they made it to the finals. But uh, they're actually in first place in the West right now. It's kind of amazing. I'm looking at this going, huh, these guys really do remember how to play hockey. There's, there's, I wish we had a team like that. We do have a team like that right now. You guys are the regular season champs. What you yeah, that's it. We just, we just never make it out of the first round. Um, <laughs> we we need gold. We needed George. I told George there. I don't know what was it about. Well, I was like at the. Oh, I think I was at the first it game was, of the season. It was when uh, Murray went down. Yeah, and, and that's right. I was actually at the. I was at the game, and I said, uh, "Get your stuff. Get your stuff, and get on the next plane to Toronto." There you go. Because we need a goalie. But right hey, now, I'm good. We I'm have, good now. I actually have uh, Leafs colors on my pads. I painted them this weekend. How do you paint your pads? There's a a product out there. It's primarily used in the auto industry called Plasti Dip. And it's a rubberized spray. 
And so you mask off the areas just like we do our models. We mask off the spots where we don't want paint. We paint a few layers. We peel the paint off and you have this rubberized coat over where you want the paint to go. And because it's rubberized, it's not paint. It doesn't harden. It remains soft and flexible. So even on the, the knee parts where the knee rolls, where the pads flex, the rubberized coating flexes with it. Wow. And when you're done and you want to change it, which is what I did over the past two weeks, was you just kind of catch, scrape it a little bit, catch a corner, and it just peels right off. And what so you it? paint over the rubberized coating? No, I peel the old old covering off and then repaint new colors. Right. I actually well, have, but, but, uh, but the color the color is rubberized then. Yeah, the paint. The, okay, the, 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 paint, the, the paint is paint. a rubber, a flexible paint. Okay, C correct. Plasti Dip has a whole bunch of different um, colors and shades, and and you can even go pearls, uh, pearlized uh, coating, and everything. I actually have a couple of videos on how to do it on my YouTube channel, um, including mm -hmm. the recent one uh, showing the finished product. I've got white pads with blue and black accent. They nice. look spectacular. Yeah. I can't wait to try them out to play you this yeah. week. Yeah, and, there you go. Yeah, are, are you familiar with the dazzle camouflage they use on ships in the war? I want to say I've heard of it, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. Because I, I always exactly. thought that, you know, goalies they always paint their pads nice and symmetric stuff. They went to dazzle camouflage, all sorts of weird things. With people coming in looking at the pads and never know what's what going which way and uh, might, might confuse the shooters more. That's the theory. And the theory be behind the white goal pad is that in the shooter coming in and fast has a, you know, a second to look up to figure out where he's shooting. The white is supposed to blend in with the back with the uh, boards and okay, the, guys. the sure. color of the sheet and so it's and then they put these odd patterns on the front that are supposed to help disguise the edges of the pads yeah so that the player is not supposed to be able to quickly discern exactly where the pads are and where to shoot because he's looking at it in such a fast time um i don't know how much i buy that's that uh description but i go with it my pads are white and they have black and blue accent now you must you be a, you must be in high demand because a a goalie that can stop uh, you know anything in in beer leagues is in high demand. Yes, I'm actually playing on the ice uh, this week, which is the last week of November, first week of December. Um, I will be on the ice five time for five games this week. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and are these stop time games? Or are they like an hour? Or what are they? How how? We we do 12 minute stop time period, so it's not a full 20 minute period. And so therefore it plays in about an hour with stop time and period and period breaks. Right. And do they do any of the teams you play on have a backup goalie or are you it? Um in, in rec leagues, we tend to have just the one. And if for something happens, like for example, a couple of weeks ago when I was up at Train Fest, um, that was our first game that Thursday I was flying out. So of course I couldn't be there. Um, so I just called other play other uh, goalies in the league and say, Hey, you're at our level. Can you fill in my game? Um, we have five teams in the A level in our division, in our town. So with, uh, games being, you know, team versus team, one team always gets a buy. So there's at least one goalie that can potentially fill in, um, without having to go down to lower levels if we need to, but that's always an option as well. Cause we have three levels and I want to say there's about 25 to 28, uh, teams throughout the, uh, all the levels here in Durango. So, I mean, worst case, you can get somebody that'll wear the pads and stand there. Now, whether they can stop it or not, it's a whole nother story. <laughs> At least well, it's a somewhat of an obstacle. Right. <laughs> like, like, every put, now like, put, like putting a pylon on a defense. <laughs> <laughs> every now and then they might accidentally get hit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. That's like most leaf goalies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There <laughs> up, you and, go. up until this year. Yeah. Uh, I was in uh, Florida not that long ago and I went to a Panthers game and they were playing the Oilers. And there was uh -huh. a bunch of Oilers fans there. And every time I walked by, I went, sorry about that old Jack Campbell thing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see he took a puck off the nose uh, a week ago or something? He was on the bench and the the one of the players went to clear it into the zone and dump it in. But one of his defensemen or whatever blocked it and deflected it right up into his face sitting on the bench. And so as the backup, he got pulled out and they pulled in the e-bug. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who don't know the lingo, e-bug stands for emergency backup goalie because uh, yeah. it actually broke his nose. And so they have goalies uh, throughout the league and they get free tickets, basically. And if one goalie goes down, they dress and put on the 
Right. Uh, yeah. Jersey for the team. Well, that, that happened to the Leafs there a couple of years ago when the yes. they playing Carolina. Yeah. Carolina. Right? Yeah, and they and, still and, couldn't and win. They, they, they still couldn't win. <laughs> they couldn't beat their backup. <laughs> they couldn't beat their. They couldn't beat their practice goalie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, it, it's, it was an interesting scenario. I just thought when that, when I saw that news, uh, I thought of you and I was like, Oh, I know he's loving this. Yeah. I am. <laughs> um, so how big is, so, so, okay. So George, uh, George, the goalie, I refer to you mm-hmm. as George actually on my phone when you're, mm-hmm. when you're, you know, I'll get a text from you when I'm at the game or I send you a text. It's mm-hmm. actually, it comes up as George, the goalie. That's, nice. how, that's how I have you in my, in my uh, phone. But, uh, that works. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm confused. Like how, so George, the goalie, George Bogatuck, the third, it mm-hmm. works for sound. How many long have you worked for soundtracks? Um, as of the beginning of November, it's been 14 years. Wow. Wow. Which I, I'm the same way when I realized that was like, wow, I've been here 14 years. That's the longest I've held any job. But to be honest with you, every time I'd moved to, you know, change jobs, it was usually a step up. Like I went from the independent parts store uh, as a counterman to a uh, dealer counterman, you know, parts guy. And uh, so those, those changes have happened over the years, but this was a complete change in career. And apparently I'm doing something right. Cause I'm still there. Throw. And how, <laughs> how long has soundtracks been in business? Uh, I think in January it will be 32, 33 years. Holy moly. So I've been there almost half of the time. Cause they started officially in, in 89 uh, but their first show was uh, Springfield in uh, Massachusetts there uh, in January of 90. And so that was their first public debut. And so that's usually what they count as their official start date. And you just love that. You love being there, don't you? Oh, I'm having a blast. I haven't worked a day in 14 years. <laughs> I, I love my job. I, I love helping our, our you know fellow modelers out with their, you know, their questions, their problems. And, and people know they can go to me if they have questions questions um i've actually had some questions come up on you know from regular customers of course but they'll ask me questions non soundtracks related just modeler related um i had one guy want me to review his track plan like, really? uh, i'll do that uh, I'll, I'll do that on my free time at night but um thanks for the uh, you know thanks for for confiding in me yeah <laughs> well yeah you're because well but you're becoming pretty well known in the hobby i mean George Bogatak is a name that people recognize because you've made such a point of, I mean, geez, how many shows do you do a year? Um, per- at our height, I want to say we did about 10 or so. Cause I do, a, I, right before the world ended um, was when we had done uh, a whole bunch of RPMs. Like we did the Chicagoland, St. Louis, Cocoa beach. I did a show up in um, Monroe, Washington, and I was on pace for about 15 shows that year. And then the world shut down in mid-March because I was going to go also to the um, Valley Forge RPM or Pennsylvania, mid, uh, whatever they call it. Um, but that all got canceled the year before we actually from the year before we actually added a few other shows. But I mean, there's there's in my opinion, take it for what it's worth. I sell it for the same price, um, but there's nothing like being able to get that one on one hands on first person experience. I mean, you can email and you're talking to some you know, could be anybody behind the keyboard, you know, it doesn't matter. But when you're there in person and they see that you're genuinely trying to help them, they tend to be a little bit, it, it leaves a lasting impression. In my opinion, um, I had, I did the first small show I did because up until, you know, a few years back, we were always doing the big shows and the big shows we would have, you know, 15 to 20,000 people through the door. And, there was always a crowd around the booth because everybody has their questions. So you have to basically triage it. You have to answer their questions. And when they want to start talking a little off topic, you're like, well, hang on a second, hold on. Let me answer these other guys' questions first. And then we can come back to it. If you're, you know, if you want to wait a minute and inevitably they'd walk away, but the smaller shows, you got to spend more of that one-on-one time. And usually sometimes when they would show you pictures of their layout and things like that, people will, think of another question that they, because you're in the moment, you're talking to the guy and trust me, I've done this before in years and years before I wore the purple shirt, you know, you go to there and you think, okay, I've got to ask these people this, this, and this, and you get there and inevitably you forget one or two of the things. And then you walk away and you know, it's busy and you're like, oh crap, I forgot to ask him this. Well, that's not a big deal because I'm not going to go back and bother him because he's got a ton of people in front of him. Um, so the smaller shows gave people time to kind of slow down and think what they were talking about. And I had more calls 
from customers who had been at that show that one time than I had at any of the bigger shows I had been to prior because it made that lasting impression. And so I used that and kind of pushed, you know, RPM is railroad prototype modelers and we really should be there because our product is designed for the prototype modeler. We, we cater to the hardcore nut and bolt guy, you know, as well as the casual guy. But I mean, there's so many features in our products that the hardcore nut and bolt guy can actually get the feel of running a real locomotive after after he spent hours and hours detailing a model to make it look exactly right now he can run it the prototypical way and and they're smaller meets i think one of the biggest ones is st louis and they were drawn i think they drew um i want to say like 850 the uh in 2021 um when we went and that was really one of the first quote unquote big shows after the the uh world had ended um and so everybody was out and getting out there um we didn't attend it this past year um, in 22, because the RP, the St. Louis RPM was two weeks away from the national show, which was in St. Louis in the exact same building. And we couldn't, we decided not to spend the money to fly out, be there, come home for a week and a half and then go back and spend the same time in the same place. Um, so I didn't go this year, but like I said, last year in 21, they had 800, 850 attendees. And that's one of the biggest ones. And that's part of why I love them so much. Um, for me is because I get to have that one-on-one -on -one time. Heck I've been at some of these shows and I learned stuff talking to customers and it, and that's, that's what makes it fun to me. I was at a, a show in Cocoa beach um, in 2020, right before the world ended. And this one customer brought me this Southern railway locomotive that he had lit up all of the, the walkway lights, but on that locomotive, the walkway lights are not built into the body. They're actually projections off of the, off, like off the top of the roof that shine a light down much like a street light would on a, on a road, on a, a, a sidewalk. And he had lit these three up on each long hood on each side of the long hood and lit up everything. I mean, he, he, I was like, wow, first of all, I didn't know that Southern railway had locomotives like that. And then second of all, just the mere fact that he was pushing the envelope and, and he was using our product. And I was so happy on all the fronts um, because I was seeing and he said what inspired me to do it was he was saw some of my stuff that I had done with my BNSF model, uh, modern stuff uh, where I had lit the step lights and the truck lights and the number boards and, all, and everything like that. He saw that and said, man, I can do this Southern Railway engine, too. There's nothing different about that. And so it inspired him to do it. And so it was a mutual. Uh, that's what I love about these these the shows and getting out to meet the people is because it is that, that first, you know, first person hands on, you get to meet the people behind the voice. And I'm not just some, you know, uh, salesman that back there just trying to peddle a product. Right. I mean, yeah. I am. I get it. I know I'm what you're saying. Just that. No, but you're, and uh, for sure, you're one of the, you're somebody that people know and after 14 years, I mean, George, the words George Bogatuck and soundtracks are synonymous with each other. Um, yep. And and you're a, you have you're you're a good modeler too. Like you do some really nice work. Like you're not just you're not just flogging decoders. You like the hobby. You're into the hobby, and and you your layout is beautiful. I mean, I've I've looked at you know I've looked at those videos too. And I mean, mm -hmm. you're doing great. You're doing great. Before we go on though, I am still confused. I remember the last time we talked. How big mm -hmm. is is uh, Durango, like population wise? Durango population wise, I think last time I heard was around seventeen thousand. How do you and guys? That's, how do you guys? That's the city. And, what's that? I said that's the city Durango. Okay. Now there's La Plata, La Plata County, which extends beyond the city of Durango. Like I live in a town called Bayfield, and I'm about twenty miles away from uh, Durango, and. You know, there's not as many out here, but the county probably has closer to twenty five or thirty thousand. Okay. I mean, by the way, I spoke with our um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> I asked you for his information you, there. You, you spoke to old what's his name? Yeah, well, I asked you for his information <laughs> there a couple of weeks ago. The guy lives there. He's a modeler, George. You sent me his information. And oh, I oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. You're talking about Mike May. Mike May, yeah. So, yeah, uh, good friend of mine. Yeah. So, we're, yeah, him and I have been contacting back and forth. Sorry, Mike, that I forgot your name. Um, but, uh, him, him and I, we're going to, I'm going to interview him. I'm really excited about that because he's got that beautiful Alaskan layout. Oh, his layout is gorgeous. <laughs> he's, and, and the amazing thing is it's small like mine. It's only a 20 foot long. I think his is about two feet deep as well. And then he has a little extension that he can remove if he needs to use his kitchen counter. Um, but <laughs> like to make a sandwich he, or he, something. 
Yeah. Well, he has it lifted up enough that he can work under it. But if they need it for like an entertaining party or something, he can take it down and store it so they can actually use it um, for more like hanging around and talking. But most of the time he leaves it up. But he's got it. I mean, this whoa, whoa, whoa. layout is amazing. His layout is in the kitchen. Well, no, it's in the living room, but then it extends. There's an extension that goes over the kitchen. I, it's kind of like an island bar. Uh, coming out of the kitchen so it's kind of the dividing wall between the kitchen and the living room uh, is he married no oh there you uh, go there you go, <laughs> there yeah. you go. That, that answers that question yeah. <laughs> so um so but he okay so my oh yeah we'll go we'll get back to that but my mm -hmm. question is and i'm still confused how do you guys come up with so many people to play hockey with such a small population um it's actually a pretty strong community um, with, and, and there are a lot of transplants. Um, I will say, I mean, of course I came from Texas. Um, we actually just had another guy move up here from the Dallas Fort Worth area. Who's on my uh, uh, a league team. Um, there's a bunch of guys come down from Chicago. Uh, so there's a lot of transplants. There's not a lot of people that are generationally here, but the ice rink has been here um, for years. And then when I moved out here, it was, I guess, not long after they enclosed it. Um, and they built a uh, like an office or a reception area where waiting area with a fireplace and then changing rooms. Uh, all that was outside before I got here. And they enclosed it for the most part, I should say. The fourth wall on the rink is actually a chain link fence. Um, <laughs> but the uh, uh, so it's always been here. So there's been a community and they've they've all kind of learned it and kind of played. And then with those of us who, you know, mute migrated here for whatever reason um it pu it pushes the level of hockey up i mean our a league team i've got guys there who play juniors uh you know and i've actually had a couple that have played semi pro in that league and it's it's actually a fun challenge i didn't grow up playing hockey i gr i started playing hockey after college um and i kind of took it up a little bit me and a, a couple of friends went out to a parking lot with some rollerblades and some sticks i got as a pizza promo and we had such a blast and that's what kind of got me into it. I started, started talking to some of the guys I worked with and we had a whole hockey rink. So I didn't start up growing it. And so I always think that that's kind of a accomplishment for me. The fact that I'm actually one of the best goalies in this league, because, you know, I didn't grow up playing it. I'm playing against guys who grew up playing. Um, and so I, I take, I think that's a little bit uh, cool just for myself, but there's a lot of transplants. And so, at, but there's also a lot of adult league. Um, and so, like, for example, A-League, we only have five levels or five teams, I mean. And there's actually some players in the A that probably should be B. But in order to make five teams, there's some exceptions to be made. Right. Um, but our, our B level was a combination of what was level three and four. And so they kind of combined. And so there's eight teams, I think, in the B level. And they're kind of a combination of some guys that – um, shall I say, or maybe lucky enough to be able to skate and, you know, shoot the puck, but at the same time, and, and that's where a lot of the adult players came in because they, they had the rink, the kids get into it. So the adults get into it. And I think that's where they end up being is the B and, and the C league. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, and that's my whole, uh, yeah. I mean, that's my, been one of my arguments when I talk about model railroaders of all different levels, I always say, you know. Uh, I'm not as good as Wayne Gretzky, but I'm a hockey player, just like Wayne Gretzky. It's just different. Le go. It's just different levels of ability. But I'm yep. thinking I should come down to Durango with my skates and my equipment. I might be. I might be able to crack one of the A teams even at my age. By the sounds, I of wouldn't wouldn't be shocked <laughs> that we've got some older guys on there. I mean, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm. I just turned 49 this week. So wow. Uh, I. <laughs> Lionel, you look good in your Butch Goring helmet and those tube skates. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when well, I you're welcome to come down to Durango anytime. I've got a spare bedroom you can have. Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. Well, and you you live in Bayfield, you say? Uh huh. And that's about twenty minutes. So is Durango like? I mean, this is uh, this is. Uh, we'll get to the train stuff, and this is train stuff, anyways, because Durango is home of the Durango and Silverton Railroad. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so is Durango kind of like a, uh, a closed in community because it's so far from everything, everybody kind of, all the natives, all the year rounders kind of rely on each other. And it's like, you know, there's hockey, there's, there's something for everybody because 
it's too far to go anywhere to do anything else kind of thing. Does that make sense? Um, I think it does. And, and I would say there's a certain level of yes and to both positive and negatives of it. And what I mean by that is the nearest big town is a town called Farmington. It's about an hour away. Um, and, you know, we have most of the, the smaller mom and pop shops, the, the local restaurants and things like that. There's some major, you know, some of the chain fast foods and a couple of, we have like an Applebee's and a Denny's and stuff like that. But, um, <clears throat> if you're wanting like a Outback Steakhouse or, uh, Olive Garden or whatever, you go to Farmington. Right. Um, but it's a trip. It's a day trip. Cause it's an hour there, hour back, not counting your time there. So you might as well hit the Sam's while you're there, hit the target or whatever else you're going to do while you're down there. Sure. Um, but, and, and so with that, the community is, has, is very, you know, close knit. I mean, everybody knows a lot of other people. And like we were talking in the locker room the other day, there's one of the guys that does nothing but excavation. And so he'll clean out a building site. And then the other guys come in and build their house on that site. Um, and so they all know each other and they all play hockey together. Right. Um, so there's, so there's that type of camaraderie, but to the negative side, customer service for locals is terrible. Um, I've been kicked out of two dealerships because of my history and <laughs> I've been banned from them because I called them out on their bull crap. And, you know, I, I did the auto parts game for 14, 15 years. I know what's going on and I know when I'm being lied to and I called them out on it. Right. And they didn't like that because, their idea is, well, they're just going to do what they do. And then when it doesn't work, you're just going to bring it back anyway. And right. so that way they get repeat business. And it's like, no, that's not how this game is played. Yeah. So to the detriment, there's also a certain level of it. And doctor's offices are the same way. They don't, they're just like, come in. They won't actually listen to you. They're going to tell you because what are you going to do? Drive an hour to go to a doctor? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. And that's sure. the, that's their attitude. Where else are you going to go? Right. You know, yeah. we have a she we have a Chevy dealer, we have a Ford dealer, we have a Toyota dealer. You know, and if you if you go in there and they, you don't like what they're saying, it's not like you can just go, you know, down the road to the competitor. It's like you got a 45 hour long drive to go to the competitor and hope your car works. Yeah, on the way down, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, but for the most part, I love it. I mean, I love the small community. I like being able to, you know, for the most part, feel a little big but also small. I mean, if we didn't have an ice rink here, we might have had a problem moving here yeah i get that yeah because you were by the time you got there you were an avid hockey player yep <laughs> which is cool which is really really cool because you and i end up having great conversations about that i mean we finally have the leafs finally have goaltending i'm very excited right now on our roster we have three goalies with uh goals against average below 2.80 i'm very very wow excited. that's how, that's good i know it's like the it's like the best move management's ever made is uh, of uh, signing Matt Murray and Samson off, two guys that were looking for to regenerate their careers. Yeah, because I was just saying Murray went to Ottawa and fizzled because Ottawa's been so bad for so many years. Yeah, that couldn't have been good for his confidence. But I'm glad they took a st uh, stab at him because he did great in Pittsburgh oh. until he got ousted. Yeah, he was a great. He was yeah, and uh, he's the perfect age to be hitting his prime, and because goalies hit their prime at a later age usually. Yes. 28 to 35, I think, is where you'll see the prime of a goalie. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, uh, do you get, uh, I'll come back to that question. Um, so, what's, uh, I want to talk to you about your layout before we get any farther. Because I, sure. I saw this video. I was looking at the video that is a, it's a soundtracks video, actually, of a, lay, a tour of your layout, a layout tour. And mm -hmm. you have these pieces that you put in, that you take in and out which mm -hmm. I thought was really slick. Uh, like how long have you been working on this layout? I'm trying to think, I think it was right around 2016, uh, 2015, 2016, because um, I had a layout when I first moved up here and it wasn't really doing what I wanted it to do, but it was something. Um, and so I decided, you know what, this isn't going to do any good. And uh, so I decided to take it out of the, uh, take it out and start building something fresh. And I was thinking of building it to Fremo standards. And so the, the actual base of the layout is built to Fremo where it's two foot wide. Um, and it's a foam base with the, with the frame around it and the holes drilled for modular. And it was blank. And my thinking was, well, if I build Fremo, I can build a massive, like throw a proper yard throat. Uh, one thing I noticed a lot of home layouts, they just build a yard, a ladder and the, then it goes to the millions of tracks or whatever. 
And uh, that's their yard ladder, but that's not actually a prototypical yard ladder. And, and you know, part of where this came from was the book um, uh, Layout Planning for Realistic Operations. Um, and my brain's going blank on the author right now. A famous author for model railroad stuff for years. Um, Bruce, but anyway, Bruce, huh? you know, all, Bruce, Bruce knows all this stuff. What's that? The author of this book. The, he... the book Realistic Plan or uh, Layout Planning for Real for Realistic Operations. John Armstrong, uh, three editions that's it. of it. That's well, it. Yes. Were you sleeping or something? <laughs> no, I, I, I was. Uh, no, I was not sleeping. I, uh, <laughs> the, the question caught me by surprise. But yeah, you know, turn on. I was. The, the yeah, first edition a was a, a black and yellow and red cover, and then the second <laughs> one had the. The guys with the track laid out on the nose of a Jeep, and the third one has a train running along with some trees and stuff. Yep. And I have the third edition. Um, but the, the discussion of yard ladders is there. So my thinking was if I build a proper yard ladder, then I can run my railroad with a simple staging area was bringing big trains in and out. And that would be all. And it would just focus on layout operations, or on yard operations. And I kind of... I wasn't in totally in love with the idea. I kind of felt one note and really didn't give me what I felt like I wanted. So I never really built that. Um, and what inspired me to finish it and to actually build it. And that's why I know it was 2016 was we were starting, we were working on tsunami two and we needed a test bed and we don't have much at the office other than loops of, of Kato Unitrack. Um, so I was like, well, here's an excuse to have a layout at home to build. So I went and I built a, a basic yard ladder that still isn't quite complete, but it's better than most. And then I built an industrial section that was based off, a uh, uh, one of the yard lay or one of the industrial area layouts in model railroaders, uh, the layout planning annual that they do, but I flipped it and, and then I was like, okay, this I like because I wanted to do some industrial switching too. But the idea of just having a single main line that just ran flat along the front with turnouts coming off of it just didn't seem very exciting. So I found this, I fell in love with the plan. And so I started building it. And by the time the uh, Tsunami 2 was ready for testing, um, I had a track plan, I had track down, I had everything wired up and lay it and ready to go. And some basic scenery which as you know it isn't much it's flat um with the exception of the town with the bridge and that was after a specific scene i was trying to recreate um so with the scenery roughed in and tracked down i got a sample from uh from work to bring home and install in a model and run it through the paces and i did and that model's still running on my layout and it was an engineering sample um so we build it robust because it's still running and it's one of the regular operating locomotives on the layout um, but that's what inspired me to get it built. And then from there, now it was, okay. Uh, one of my friends was telling me, he said, you know, make progress every night, do something, go out there. If you ballast six inches of track, you still made progress. If you go upstairs on the lay, you know, on a workbench and you drill a hole, you're still made progress. Right. It may not be much, but it's always something. And if you don't feel like working on stuff, go up and drill a hole and then put it down and go to bed. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, and so, so that that was the approach I took to to uh, the layout, wiring, and scenery, and and got it done to the point where it's presentable. And most of the buildings are recycled from my prior layout back in Texas. And and where is the layout situated in a, in the garage or something? Yeah, it's in the garage along one wall because um, I can pull the car inside and park next to it, which is part of the reason the old layout went down. Um, I mean, I wasn't real happy with the old layout anyway, but it was, it worked in the place in Texas. It didn't work here. Right. Um, and so, uh, being it being needing, to be able to put the car in the garage, uh, was important. So I built a 20 foot long shelf switching layout along the wall. And then having been in modular layouts all through Texas, uh, growing up doing everything, I just decided, you know what, here's two sections. One's just a switching lead with scenery. And the other would become the removable staging yard. So I don't necessarily have to have the staging yard to run the layout, right. but I have to have the switching lead if I'm switching the industrial area. Right. I get you. So the, the staging yeah. yard's in front of the garage door, right? Correct. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. looking at the video here. Yeah. And I mean, and, I, and your hockey equipment's hanging under uh, up underneath there. So you can't yep. have, you can't have people over for operating if you've just been hanging up your sweaty hockey equipment. <laughs> Well, that'd be, that'd be kind of funky. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, and, and my wife can tell you the same thing too, is that after every game, no matter what time of night it is and when I play again, everything comes home 
it hangs up. All the undergarments go through the wash and the gear has a box fan put on it. So in the morning it's all dried. Okay. So there isn't, there isn't quite as bad of a funk as there are in some people. Like you go into <laughs> some of the, lo- the, you go into yeah. some of these locker rooms and these guys open their bags in August or in October when we first open up and you're like, you'd think that the wrath of Satan has just been released out of this guy's bag. And you're like, what the hell dude? And he goes, well, I hadn't opened it since we played last tournament. And that was April. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. <laughs> and you're like from April to October, then it's out in his garage in the heat. And yeah. that's just festering all that stuff. And that's where the smell comes from. It's all the, the bacteria and stuff. And so by hanging it up, which was part of the design of the layout was to incorporate a shower curtain rod right into the, uh, into the, um, the supports, the, the, it protrudes off the wall. I'm trying to think of the right word. Yeah. It cantilevers off the wall. Yeah. Um, the and then bracket. I built that in there. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did was I put a, a clothes rod in there that I can hang the gear up. So my chest and arm, my pants, everything gets hung up, uh, on those. And the box fan gets put right there. So by the morning, like I said, everything's dry. So this week, like I mentioned, I'm playing five games this week. Uh, before four of those, my gear will be dry. The fifth game is the second of the uh, second game on Thursday night. I got asked to sub. Right. But so you're going to, and then, then there's nothing worse again, the damp equipment on your oh cold hockey God. bag and putting it on. <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, and then that's also what happens to leads to premature gear. Uh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, degradation um, because all that stuff starts attacking the foams and the plastics and yeah. everything. And it just breaks it down and then you just need more. And that stuff ain't cheap. Like these no. new leg pads, new top of the line leg pads nowadays are 1900 bucks. Um, I'm going to take care of the ones I have as long as I can. Um, I see on your layout, you have like a race shop there. Uh, well, technically it's not, it's supposed <laughs> to be uh Belfour liquor. Oh, okay. Um, and so, well, Belfour Plastics is what I'd actually called. But Ed Belfour, after he retired, he opened up a liquor company called Belfour um, Whiskey. Okay. And, or Belfour Spirits or something like that. So I used his actual logos on the building, but it's actually a plastics plant. But I had those um, 187th race cars that I used to get at Walmart for like four bucks. And so I'd buy two, three, four of them at a time and just stash them. And so with all these race cars at the time, that was the the guy, the 29 in the yellow car was Kevin Harvick when he first started in right, the yeah. shell. Um, and so I would buy those in bulk because of course that was my, you know, my driver. Um, so I just was like, well, let's put them out somewhere on the layout. So they look good, but they need to go put away. Um, but that's the Belfort plastics place. Okay. Yeah, Ed Belfort was a goalie in the NHL for those who don't know. And yep, I'm sure, and I'm, and I'm sure there's people in South Africa and New Zealand and Australia that have no idea what we're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. And he played for the stars and the Leafs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he did. He was, the last time we had good goaltending was Ed Belfour. Cause he came, he came after Curtis Joseph, didn't he? He Correct. did. Yeah, exactly. That was the last goalie we had. Well, I think we're on our way now. Uh, my son says what you need is a guy it's going to stop two or three sure or one or two sure goals a night. That's what you need. I mean, you know, you, you can't expect a guy to be, have a shutout every night, but you got to have that guy that's going to stop one or two goals a night. Makes you, sense. You know, one or two good chances. That's what keeps you in the game. So how yeah. often do you, do you uh, put your layout up in full and, and do you leave it up for a, a few days or? Um, well, it only takes about 15 to 20 minutes to put all that stuff up, as you can see in the layout or in that video. Um, the one has the cantilevered uh, support on the other side of the entryway. That's the switching lead. And the other is just um, PVC pipe legs. So they literally just slide under it. So it doesn't take long to put it up and down. The bigger challenge of leaving it up for a significant amount of time is the fact that it blocks the entryway into the garage. And that's where our extended pantry is um, with canned goods and things like that because the house that we're in doesn't have much storage in the kitchen there's one little tiny closet and that's about it so um, if you're storing stuff you need to put it out in the garage in the storage building which is part of the reason also why the layout doesn't transcend all the way around the room um and I, so i bet there's a lot of a lot of uh guys in model railroading that are happily married because they have these wives that put up with all this crap <laughs> they they do and i will tell you one of the one of the oddest things that happened when i met my wife we um the car was outside it started raining i was afraid it was hailing and so i was upset because the car wasn't in the garage and i was out on this date with her and i started pan- made some comment about it and 
She's like, well, why isn't the car in the garage? What's in the garage? I said, never mind. I'll tell you later because <laughs> you know, the, the model railroading is, isn't exactly the lady pleaser as most people would want to think. So then I saw the fear on her face of what the hell does this guy have in his garage? Yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. Slow down. It's just model trains. And she went, Oh, my dad did that. What scale do you work in? I was like, Oh, oh there crap. you go. She's a keeper. Uh, I, I kept her. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, you're right. They need that support. And I think it's important, you know, that you do the things there and do it together. Cause like one of the other things she, you know, we chased the uh, big boy last summer and okay. I put a video on my personal YouTube channel, which is goalie George on there chasing the big boy. And the first pass is me out on a hillside catching it and she's by the crossing. And as the train passes the crossing, she records and of course does the, the typical rail fan panning shot as it's passing. So you get it coming and then going. Right. And in that time she muttered, that's awesome. And then realized she was filming and went, don't, <laughs> and so I, she she gets embarrassed because i tell everybody about that but i mean it, it just shows that level of, of of support and commitment that you know she can enjoy this just as much as i can sure and so she she's a, a big boy gal she's a steam gal and so we live in the right town for her and um you know so, so she enjoys it and i think that's important so do you enjoy the fact that the Durango and Silverton's in your backyard and it's like right there all the time. Like you get involved in some of the, you know, like the Victoria, what was that thing they did? The Victorian roundup and in 2021 and all that. Um, well, the, the that, Victorian roundup was, was actually it, the Cumbers and Toltec. Right. Oh yeah. It was in and that China. one's about two, that one's about two hours away. Um, but as far as like the other special events, I don't really. And part of it is because there's a lot of volunteer time and I don't always have that volunteer time, whether it's during the day, especially during work hours right. or a weekend where like I might be at a show or something like that. So, um, I know a lot of the people that work there, a lot of them are modelers, um, and we talk a lot, but I don't go over there and like do a lot of the volunteer stuff, uh, dressing up in period or anything like that. Um, but to answer the first question, do I love having it there? Absolutely. I get to see those nasty old steam engines run through town every day. That uh, just breaks my heart. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so is there is there an active model railroad community in Durango? Um, yes, but I will say that's very independent. Um, there's a handful of people that are here. There's a, uh, the San Juan, um, region of the NMRA, uh, is down in this area and they have active groups. And, and actually you mentioned Mike May, Mike May just got his master model railroader, um, at the October, October meet. So, uh, congratulations to him, of course. Um, yes, well done. But yeah. uh, so there, there's, there's enough here, but I don't think there's enough of the go somewhere. There's not a club. Right. Um, so what it is, is everybody has to work on everybody's personal layouts. And so that's where you get a little bit of that fractured element because not everybody wants just any Joe Blow trampling through the house. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. But, but is there, do you feel like, like, I mean, per capita, is it fairly po populated for model railroading? Mm, I would say probably not. Okay. Uh, most of the people that I'm aware of are uh, either involved in the railroad which is about four or five people that I can think of off the top of my head. Right. And then you have probably about 15 to 20, maybe uh, where about 10 of them are armchair or they go to somebody else's and work. Okay. Um, there was one gentleman that he unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was, he's been published in model railroad or magazine. He, his layout was called the Athabasca and he had a John Armstrong uh, right, lay, yep. uh, layout design yep. and he was in the magazine articles. I think his last article before he passed away was insulating tunnels where he used soundproofing foam so that when your locomotive went into the tunnel, it didn't sound like it was still in front of you because you had that, that foam in there to deaden the sound so that it, you know, felt like you were in a tunnel. Anyway, the point is, is when he passed away, um, the, he was part of the quote unquote Durango model railroad club, which is like I said, a group of people and they kind of meet around at different places. Well, there's a couple of the guys that are in charge of that, that continue to operate his layout today. Um, they actually had an operating session, November 11th, I think it was where they invited people to come out and run trains. And so the layout's still there, his wife's accommodating and wanting his, her husband's legacy to live on. This is what he really wanted. And so they'll come over and spend some time in working on it, but it's, it wasn't their layout. And so I don't know how often they're over there, Sure, but 
they go over there and, and maintain it and run it. Um, and a lot of people are involved in that part rather than, like I said, going to other people's house. Um, there was another narrow gauge modeler, modelers in HON3. I've known him for years because, of course, he bought Blackstone stuff. And I had never been to his layout. And it wasn't that <laughs> I didn't want to necessarily. And I don't think it was he didn't want me there. It was just the, the – it was yeah. – Never that, hey, what are you doing tonight? Come over and run trains or come over and see the layout or whatever, you know. Yeah, and that's fine. And that's where I think it is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're not going to, you can't, you, some people, you're just not going to get around to catching up to them for a while. And it's it's all got to work out, you know, because people have lives and stuff like that. And and yeah. uh, so you said Blackstone Models. That's pretty much dead, isn't it? No, it's just on hiatus. Um, the honest answer, what I tell everybody when they call is watch the travel blogs. And as soon as we can travel to China as free human beings without having any restrictions or lockdowns or quarantines or anything like that, we'll start planning our trip over there. Cause we have to, uh, investigate and inspect the tooling and then probably look at moving it to another factory where we can get, get the costs down. Um, in July of 2019, we were given a quote from our current factory to rerun that's not brand new product, new tooling. That's rerun a K27. I would have to sell it for about $1,400. The last, Ooh. the last MSRP was four seventy five. dollars um, So that's a thousand dollars more and it's the same factory and no new tooling. So that's when we realized, okay, we can't just keep negotiating. They're going to keep jacking the price up. So we have to look at this. And so we actually had it narrowed down to a couple of factories that we were going to investigate and look at moving the tooling. And then there was this pesky virus that popped up that shut the world down. And so that's kind of where we're at. So it's not dead. It's not going away. It's just, uh, you know, un, you know, yeah, we have so. to be able to, vol- to travel over there because if we just call up and say, hey, move the tooling, things are conveniently lost, damaged, scraped. Because even inside of a mold, um, if there's a scratch, the mold's useless. Yeah. So – if they're if they're handing it over to these new people, the new people have no idea what the molds are supposed to look like. So they open it up and just put a little kind of casual scratch on every one. And guess what? All of our tooling's junk. <laughs> and <laughs> if we go over there and inspect it first, if they've already done that for whatever reason, then we can say, hey, these are no good. You need to remake these because you, you damaged our property. Right, exactly. You so know, and be, yeah, because it's kind of cutthroat, isn't it? That business over there. It's well, the the biggest challenge is because we don't have any standing in their court system, and all of the businesses are basically government government owned with appointed business owners who report to the government. And so, um, like for example, the factory that we currently use is is uh, the same one that owns Bachman as the parent company. Um, so it's actually the company that owns Bachman and that factory overseas does a lot of stuff. Um, one time I remember a few years back, we got a sample from Bachman to do some uh, decoder fitting with, to make sure the decoder settings and size and all that stuff were right. And it came looking like a Ronald McDonald. It was orange and, and yellow. And I asked, I asked the, the guy from Bachman, I said, why is this? And he goes, oh, well, they just use whatever plastics in the machine and our factory makes the Nerf stuff. <laughs> And so they had just got done a run of Nerf. So they put their molds for whatever it was. I think it was an S2 or something. They put it in there, shot it with whatever was in it, and then sent it off because they didn't care about the uh, paint schemes. They didn't care about the, the you know, uh, lettering or anything. It was literally just for sizing, mechanical uh, testing, and evaluation. So they could use whatever was in it. So point being is that that factory makes a lot of things in much bigger mass than what we do for model trains. And so when a lot of these companies overseas don't want to do the work, they jack the price up because they can make more money making, we'll say, you know, 500,000 Nerf guns versus, you know, a 200 or uh, uh, 2,000 models. You know, where there's a lot of intricate parts to put on, like all the piping and all the steam domes and the cab and the all that stuff. They, those Nerf guns, they shoot a couple pieces, slap it together with a spring, tighten some screws, and it's done. Throw it in a box, I'm done. Yeah, exactly. There's the quality control is a lot lower level than stuff for yep. my rarity. And yet, so let me ask you this question. So all of uh, your, all your decoders, though, are made at the factory in Durango, right? Correct. All of our electronics are made here. Um, we manufacture all the decoders and that's where, you know, one of the things that, that I'm very proud of. And part of the reason why I, I love working where I do is because we do build the electronics here. Um, 
all the electronics go through the machines and our machines have several tests along the way during the manufacturing process uh, to make sure that when we ship a decoder out, it's in good working condition, including a hand test by our technicians downstairs. So when the decoder comes off, the, first of all, when the decoder is being built, there's a quick flash test on the part to make sure it's the correct part, puts it on the board. Then once the board is assembled and it's finished on both sides, then it goes through what's called a flying probe test. And as its name implies, has a set of probes that fly around the circuit board and they test all the circuits and make sure that the solder joint is good. The parts are within spec and the meters reading what it's supposed to read. Then once that's done, then they go and cut them into individual decoders and that's where they perform the hand test. So they'll plug it into a fixture which will simulate a locomotive and they'll have lights, speaker, motor attached to it. And then the technicians run through a quick test to test the functionality of the motor, to test to make sure the lights work and to test to make sure the sound is crisp and clear and to make sure that it performs according to the way the engineer's designed. If there's a problem, they set it aside and they'll go address it separately and either fix it or toss it depending on what they find. Um, but if there's, a, but when it's good, it gets an inspection sticker that's put on it. And that's usually the sticker you see on the processor. And that means that decoder has been hand tested and then it goes into the packaging. And the reason this is important is because every single decoder that goes out of our uh, facilities have been hand tested. That goes for decoders we ship to Athern or Bachman or whoever. They all get tested decoders just like you would when you purchase them aftermarket. And so when they get them over there to the factory, their factory doesn't have to be the quality control and then have to order more decoders because 20 of them failed or whatever. If right. they have two failures, you know, that's, that's huge. So um, the, that's a lot. So our locomotive, that's uh, an Atherin locomotive that's manufactured in China is, is using a, a decoder that's manufactured in Durango, Colorado. That's correct. And that's part of why, um, you know, some of the other companies had switched brands from Soundtracks to other brands. And part of the reason is because the other brand is built in China and that was part of their selling point. Well, look, if it's built in China, you don't have to do all the paperwork and, you know, for export, import, you know, and taxes and all this stuff. But the, you know, the folks at Atherin understand the differences between the product and they understand what they're getting more so than just a bunch of guys running a company that, you know, well, I don't care what it does as long as it makes noise. Um, you know, the customer will be happy and they'll buy it. And, you know, so there, you know, and I'm not saying all of them are like that. I'm just saying there are some of them that are like that. And so it's an easier method to be able to deal with it. So that way, the only thing they're importing is a finished product, not having to deal with all the stuff. And then the other factor is because we build here, we have to build in time to ship it overseas. And so they're having to turn in their quantities and POs, uh, purchase orders to us sooner than they would if it was all built in China, where it's a down the street, or in some cases, the same building delivery. And uh, how was it? How has it been trying to to ship your stuff to China? I mean, you guys are going the opposite way from everybody else. Has it been? Uh, have you guys had the same kind of problems trying to get your stuff over there? Um, for the most part, no. But there have been some instances. I think um, we were talking about this last week that there's a uh, shipment of decoders that have been sitting in Chinese customs since August that Atherin hasn't gotten yet. Um, and so there's nothing any of us can do about it is we can call them all day long, but if they're not going to release them from Chinese customs to be able to make their trip to the factory, then, you know, there's nothing we can do. Um, so we're trying to talk about what, you know, how to address that. Um, but so, but for the most part though, they're still getting there. The shipments are going, I don't know what was on this particular one. And it may have been something else that was in the, the container for all I know. Yeah. Um, you know, but it every now and then something like that may happen. But for the most part, you know, we haven't seen any major issues that I'm aware of. Um, so well, over the years, uh, there's certainly been an evolution in uh, features and everything in all the decoders. And I know some of them out there now, they have a gazillion and three functions on them. Is Are we getting to a point where you, you're going to have function overload on Dakota because you know some of them now you're on a throttle you got into get like the third level of uh, shifting day to get function 49 or something like that and to, you know to run all these uh literally all the bells and whistles uh so it, 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 are we going to get like function fatigue do you think um that's honestly a great question um and and i'll address it in two different uh parts well, come, before, so the first bef part, before we go, go on before we go on have some of our questions not been that good no. 
Okay. Well, They've just, all been fine. Okay. You just said that that was a great one. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, well, I, I hope we didn't waste your time the first hour. I mean, I was interested. <laughs> <Holy Pat. laughs> I'm having fun. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm having a blast. Um, so I think, uh, no, everything's been great. But the reason I point that particular one out is there, there's a certain level of, it depends on the modeler. And what, what we talk about that is there's a certain level of the guy who likes to open up the track, open up the locomotive, put on the track and run it. And that's all they do. Um, they don't necessarily care what all the features are. They don't know anything about real trains, um, how they run. And so they just want to be able to blow the horn, ring the bell and run it. Um, I have a really good friend customer uh, that um, he doesn't care what his locomotive sounds like. He put, you know, an EMD, G, EMD decoder into a GE locomotive. Um, and, you know, he asked me, he said, is this right? And I said, well, technically no, but you can make up a backstory to show that it was changed. And so he said, yeah, I like that idea. So we left it. Um, and so there's a certain level of that. And then, so for that particular product, we have something called Economy, which is our budget sound system. It's basically, um, a little bit better than what the original Tsunami was. Um, but it's not, it doesn't have pun intended, all of the bells and whistles the Tsunami 2 does. So that way somebody who, who just likes to run the trains and wants a basic sound system that they're going to have good quality audio and they're going to have a good experience with it can use Economy. Um, then there's the level of the, the guys who are fully into prototypical operations, recreating them on their layout. And this is where um, I think there's a, I, I think there's definitely a learning curve because of course the way we do it is different than say another brand. Uh, so for example, like braking, you know, we have a, uh, independent and automatic braking that's selectable with a function button. And then you use another function button to actually apply the brakes and it's an on off function. And there's other ones that do it differently and they either may have a separate button for independent, separate button for automatic, or they just have one braking system. And again, it just depends on how the decoders are used. And, and so I'd say with a little bit of a learning curve with each different brand, um, some things don't always work um, exactly the same between brands. And so it makes it a little challenging. And so in some cases, someone says, well, I want this particular scale trains locomotive. And then I want this Atherin locomotive and they have two different brand decoders. And well, uh, as long as they run together, horn and bell, I'm good. I don't need all the braking stuff. And, it, and so there there's, but that's partially because either he's using two different brands or he just doesn't want to get into it or his, his level of comprehension may be different. Again, it doesn't, it, it, it may vary. Um, I'm, I tend to be one of the prototypical guys where uh, I, and, and, you know, kind of stemming on the question, what, you know, do you love having the train here? Yes. I've learned so much about railroad operations from the train being here because I know these guys and I go out there and I ask him, well, what's this guy doing? And he tells me. And so I implement those kind of things into my layout when, when you operate, because our small layouts can become bigger if you implement a, a few stages of what the real railroads do, because it takes longer to do things. Um, and so because that, is what I personally enjoy is the prototypical side of it. It gives me that ability, that mastery of the decoder that when customers call up and ask, I can explain to them the feature based on their level of experience and or desire. Um, I had a customer one time come up to me and he says, so why should I buy Tsunami 2? And I, my first question is always, well, what's important to you? What do you want the decoder to do? And when they answer that, then I can tailor the answer to their, to their response. And that way they can find out that they're getting the best of what they want it to do. Cause if somebody just wants to run it around, blow the horn, ring the bell, maybe tsunami two is not your option. Maybe you buy two economies instead of one tsunami two. And now you can have two locomotives running instead of one. Um, but tsunami two is certainly the flagship. Um, it's definitely, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of modelers, especially the prototype guys, uh, the discerning modeler who wants, you know, these are the guys that, that, want to buy the highest detail, they want to add stuff to models, definitely can and uh, would be happy with the Tsunami 2 and definitely are looking for that. Um, but then the second part of answering your question, when it comes to the DCC systems, you're right, you have to hit, you know, pound, shift, toggle, you know, pat your head and spin in a circle to get to function, whatever. Um, right. And that's where it becomes, I think, a little bit challenging too, because every DCC system is a little different and how they access or, um, get to the higher functions may challenge some people. Um, I get a lot of times where somebody will call up and say, Hey, I want to do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, yeah, you can do that. This is how you do it. And you kind of get that glassed over response. Oh, okay. And you, you, you realize that they probably don't know how to use their DCC system or they don't know the, the, 
you know, all of that. And I'm trying to educate. I, I, I believe 100% education, but I inevitably always get that response. Well, I, I guess I'll just leave it. I'll live with it. Yeah. It's like, you yeah, don't have to. Yeah, because there are guys out there now, and I, I've seen, been following a, a guy just doing some stuff in Inskill. It's incredible, but you know, they want the working class lights. They want the, you know, the headlights high, low, and they want the cab lights. They want the walkway lights. They want the uh, the ground lighting under their trucks and uh, the ditch lights and everything else. And, you know, that that's a lot to be hanging off a little, uh, little decoder and then be able to get to it. Yeah. And a lot of it depends on the models too, because in N scale, more and more people are starting to be interested because you have some micro LEDs that are the, you know, the size of a tip of a pencil. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I've been using a lot of those lights in my modern stuff, you know, lighting up, you know, step lights and, and class lights and number boards and truck lights and whatever else, um, because I can fit them and the wires are nice and small. What I do is I'll use a small piece of heat shrink tubing that I haven't shrunk glue it up to the inside of the body shell. So it's still flexible. So if it does come into contact with the frame, the, the tubing will flex, but it holds those wires in place. And that's where, you know, you can do wire management a little better than what we ever could before. But in N scale, those guys are starting to get to that. And you're right. It's, it's a challenge. It's definitely something different because, you know, a lot of models over the years, especially in N scale, haven't been designed for sound, let alone adding all these lights. Um, well, uh, end scale is kind of like a bad Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> <laughs> no, now we love our end scalers. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we keep making more decoders for them. Oh yeah, so is end scale kind of growing more? Do you feel? Do you see that happening? Um, I I don't know if growing is the right word. I'm sure it is. Um, I've never personally partaken in the end scale market, but I know they're definitely getting more and more vocal. Um, asking for decoders designed for N-Scale. So we just announced uh, recently our new Next 18, which is only nine and a half millimeters wide. Um, and then we have, uh, that's designed to plug into a Next 18 plug that's in a lot of models. I know Scale Trains is using them. Rapido and some of their N-Scale stuff is using them. And even, um, um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Fox Valley or something had a Next 18 in it. Um, I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me on that. What's a, what is a Next we, What is a Next 18? It's an 18 pin micro connector. That's only nine and a half millimeters wide. Oh, okay. And hmm. it's designed kind of like the 21 pin for HO, but with her N scale in mind. So it's a small flat connector that is being used in the more N scale models. And so we announced a decoder recently for it. That's only nine and a half millimeters wide. But if you're, if you don't have that next 18 connector, we do have an X 18 adapter, which is a small little circuit board with the reciprocating plug yeah. and then solder pads and wires coming off of it so that you can install it as a universal decoder. And it's actually thinner than what our, our smallest, uh, TSU 1100 universal decoder is because the 1100 is 10 and a half millimeters wide. Um, and so in some in scale models, it's a tight fit, but this, uh, next 18 is even smaller. So it makes it even better. So the end scalers are growing They're They're becoming more vocal and, you know, we're looking at trying to find ways to service them better, especially now that we've got these micro speakers, these cell, uh, cell phone cube speakers, um, that have been repurposed and, you know, make, you know, amazingly quality audio out of small packages. And that was one of the challenges before was the speakers, they just weren't good for N scale. They didn't, they made noise, but they wasn't great audio. Yeah. Now what kind of current draw are these N scale ones? Cause I'm thinking if you're getting packages that small now, this could also flip over some of the smaller HO scale locomotives, like a GE 44 tonner, or some of these small 040 steam engines, that kind of thing. So that, you know, by developing that product, you're also getting into the smaller size of the HO locomotives. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, you know, the 44 tonners, stuff like that. The, the motor rating is one amp, which is one amp stall. And you always want to pay attention to stall current because every time you go from zero to speed step one, your motor recreates a stall condition when power is applied to a stationary motor. So it's not because we think you're going to lock up your motor or you're going to yeah. lock up your drive or anything like that. So, and I have a video on why you want to do that, um, explaining that on our YouTube channel for soundtracks. But um, so it's you know, a one amp stall. You know how you were it's, just mentioning the guy that you explained something to and he kind of goes, uh-huh. And you know that he's not getting it. That's okay. Me. That's me. What all you're just saying. That's me. I'm going, okay. uh, uh-huh. But no, I so, carry, carry on. I, I'm kind of familiar with stall speeds and stuff from them. Well, let me, 
past career lo- looking at you know three four hundred and hundred horsepower locomotives and uh, you know well, interest curtains and it's like not that. that it's not that important i mean i'm enjoying the discussion because i'm i'm following along here like i looked i found the yeah. next 18 adapter kit on the soundtracks website it's like 17 bucks 16.95 mm-hmm. yeah. so yeah i'm following along with all the micro stuff and everything i mean it's fascinating yeah. it's all fascinating yeah, I mean, and it's amazing to me, and 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 I've learned so much more, you know, ever since you know I came to Soundtracks, and and you know when I was a modeler before, I was on the DCC committee, um, because I'd figured out most of stuff, and that's what I figure a lot of people are on the DCC committees because they figured out a bunch of stuff, but I'd learned I knew nothing, and so that's why education is my big. Uh, uh, you know, kind of motivating factor for me is because whether they always say knowledge is power, and when you know what's happening instead of guessing, you're not afraid of it. And when you're guessing, you're afraid something's going to happen. But if you know how it works, then you're not afraid of it. And so that's why I'm, I'm pushing on education. So here's a two-minute uh, dissertation on stall current. Um, when we run a power pack, a normal DC power pack, we turn the throttle, voltage goes up, one volt, two volt, three volts, whatever. As the, as the voltage goes up, motor turns faster, train goes faster. Pretty simple. A decoder, A decoder does not work the same way where, you know, a lot of people will assume that because our motors turn faster, but that's not how it's working. So power to the motor is either on or off. It's basically controlled by a fancy transistor through a, a different type of circuit, but it's a transistor and the transistor is powered by the processor. And when the processor wants to send power to the motor, it closes the transistor, which completes the circuit and sends you know, the, the power to the motor. But what it does, and I'm sure you guys have all heard the, the, the term pulse width modulation or PWM. Oh, for sure. And, I, I talk, Bruce and I talk about that all the time, post-modulation. Oh, yeah. We've, uh, had, we've, had, we've had many a beer discussing that. Yeah. <laughs> so the way I use the description as a definition is the, the decoder is modulating or changing the width or duration of the pulse of power. So the transistor is turning on and then it's turning off. And the duration of the on time helps dictate the speed of the motor. So think of it like a light switch where you turn it on or off. If you were to turn it on longer than it's off, your room will appear brighter. And that's what that's the way the motor's being controlled in the decoder. And so the reason stall current's important is because every time you go from zero to speed step one, doesn't matter how many cars you have behind your locomotive or any of that, that pulse of 14 volts or whatever your track voltage is, is now being sent to that stationary motor. Even though it's only for a millisecond or two, it that that is recreating stall. And that pulse of power gets the motor turning. That's where you're seeing the maximum amount of stall current or, or current draw. And that's where, like, for example, we had a, a product in our previous line with the original Tsunami, the Micro Tsunami, or also known as the TSU 750, which was rated for three quarters of an amp. Now, there was a fast burn fuse that if you exceeded three quarters of an amp, it would burn and it had to send it back to the factory for repair. The reason the three quarter amp was was the rating was because of the uh, heat load that was generated by the processor, the amplifier, the motor control circuits, everything. If you went over, if you stalled over three quarters of an amp, you could potentially overheat the decoder and damage it. So that's why the the uh, fast burn fuse in there was was there. Our biggest repair on that decoder was was changing that fuse. Because people said, oh, well, it's three quarters of an amp stall. Well, my model never stalls out. I don't have to worry about that. And so they put it in their um, their Athern RTR or blue box models because that's all they had space for without doing some creative engineering inside. And next thing you know, it's coming back because the motor uh, circuits were burned out because those blue, those blue box motors drew 1.2 to 1.4 amps, depending on your track voltage. Um and so that's why it's important is because we want to make sure that you're within the rating. And so when we talk about the next 18, it's rated for one amp. And so you're not going to install that into an Athern Blue Box or an Athern RTR. Um, you're probably going to be looking at some of the more, you know, advanced models. And even in some cases, like, for example, the Kato uh, P42 with those uh, those two coreless motors in it, that won't get anywhere near one amp, even with two motors. So you should be good for using it on there if space becomes an issue. But I know in that one, you've got plenty of space, but that's just an example. Um, I have my small little uh, Bachman HO440 with the new tooling that has a small little coreless micro motor that stalls at like four tenths of an amp at 14 volts. So I could I could put one of those in there. No problem. Uh, are you making notes of this, Bruce? 
Absolutely. Um, did that make Did that make sense to you? Did it help explain oh, why? Sure, sure, it made sense. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> I, no, it did. Uh, I think I know there's somebody out there that's getting a ton of information, and I'm interested. I mean, I'm fa- I love listening to you. I love your enthusiasm. Like, how did you learn? Because you came from, like you say, you came from dealerships uh, as a parts guy, parts manager. Mm-hmm. How did you learn all this electrical stuff? Is it, are you just natural at it, kind of thing, or? I made myself. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I sort of have a little bit of a technical idea of mindset. Um, when I was going to, uh, when I was in high school, I was one of the leaders in our uh, computer programming classes that I was actually teaching, helping the instructor teach the beginner class because our advanced class was held at the same time for that reason. Um, so he could give us as the advanced group, like a, a, um, a task. And then he would have to hold the hands of the beginner group. Well, if we were done our task, then we were asked to get up and help the other kids in the class. Um, but and then when I went to college, I wanted to go in for CSE, which is computer science engineering. But I fizzled out. I didn't finish. Um, so I always just tell everybody, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm just a dumb sales guy. I'm not an engineer. Um, I have some a basic knowledge, which is enough to be dangerous. But. Um, my story with DCC was when I bought my first DCC system at the time I was running CVP's rail command. Right. Um, and I understood that because I could put all the settings in the, the memory of the, the base unit. And then when I wanted to set an address, I would physically cut traces. Again, I can understand what I'm doing there. When I brought my DCC system home and I bought it because everything was going to DCC. Oh, here's the standard DCC. And then you're seeing all these decoders popping up out of everywhere. Now there's sound and you're just like, wow, hold on a minute. Maybe rail commands dying uh, obsolete, you know, kind of like once upon a time we had. Right. Beta, yeah. Yeah. You know? And so, so I go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. You know, you go ahead. You carry on. I, I so I bought my CVP easy DCC because it had easy in the name. Right. And the guy was local. Um, when I was living in Dallas, he's in North Dallas. So I could go over there if I needed to expand, buy new parts. I didn't have to mail order anything. And if I had problems, I could go to his factory, which is his house, and see what was going on. And he could fix it right there or whatever the case was. Um, I got home, hooked it up, and started reading through the instruction manual. And I went, oh, dear God, what did I get into? And I'm looking through this manual and nothing is making any sense whatsoever. And I just was like, uh, okay, well, there's $400 well spent. Let's put that in the closet for now. My rail command works still. And I ran it for two more years. And again, more and more stuff's coming out. DCC, you can see this, the steering of the market towards it because, you know, one of the advantages of DCC is that I didn't have to buy only CVP receivers I could buy a Digitrax receiver and use it on my NCE system, or I could buy a, you know, NCE decoder and use it on my Digitrax system or whatever the case right, was. Right. Yeah. Right. And so I sat down and I said, you know what? I, I've already done the hard part. I bought the dang thing. That was the hardest part was parting with $400 as a model railroader. You guys can understand that. Um, so I went in and I said, okay, let's look at this with fresh eyes. I haven't touched it in two years. Let's sit down. And I sat down and read it again. And now suddenly everything started making more sense. And I was like, okay, I can kind of see what's going on here. And so I got my decoder, I put it in and then started doing it. And I'm like, all right, I see how this is. And it made perfect sense to me after that. And so it it kind of goes back to like, honestly, I made myself. And so when a new locomotive would come out, like say Broadway limited with a, a QSI uh, decoder at that point in time, or it was an Atlas with an Atlas commander decoder, whatever it was like, just read the manual. That's all you have to do. And it tells you what it's doing. But I think a lot of people, and I, I fall guilty of this too. You start reading it and it's dry reading. It sucks. I will tell you that it's hard to write a manual that's interesting and riveting. Um, and and our manuals are some of the best out there. And I'm not trying to just toot our own horn. Um, some of the manuals are sparse at the best. They barely give you enough information to figure it out. But one of the biggest challenges I had to teach myself was I can adjust this again. If I don't like what I did or I programmed it wrong, I can always reset it and start over. Right. Um, you know, nothing set in stone. In other words, if I set the wrong address, it's not like I can never change it again. Um, and so 
because of that, I basically made myself learn it. So I would sit at home and tinker around with different settings and I would make the, make the decoder do this. And I'd say, well, what the hell is a Mars light? And I'd go in and set the headlight to become a Mars light. I was like, oh, that's what it does. Okay. What's a, what's a rotary beacon look like? Or what is a, you know, gyro light? What's the different, you know? And so I started doing that and that's where I kind of do- dove into it to make myself learn it. And we had in my train club back in Texas, there was another guy who was kind of the same way, another amateur, just like myself, but he'd figured out a lot of it. And so him and I were the ones everybody looked up to when it came to running trains and running the DCC system. And the, the difference between him and I was his answer was, well, everything's going wrong because it's not a Digitrax. And it's like, <laughs> well, that's not the answer. There's a reason we need to find the reason. And it's that, that, inquisitive mind of mine that was like okay let's find the reason and when i found the reason it wasn't because it wasn't a digitrack system it was because uh qsi at that point was setting cv11 which is called packet timeout to shut the locomotive down after we'll say 20 seconds of no command well this is where the different systems vary because cvp doesn't send a new command unless something changes so if you fiddle the throttle or push a function it doesn't send another command and that's how it reduces traffic. So you get that instant response. Digitrax on the other hand, sends a full command constantly over and over and over again. So on his Digitrax system, the locomotive would run just fine because it was constantly receiving packets. But on the CVP system, the locomotives would suddenly stop. And then of course the guys are like, what's wrong with my locomotive? And they fiddle the throttle and then it would start running again because there's the new command. Yeah. Well, and, I, got, I got all that. Didn't you Bruce? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh uh george just anyway. for, george just for a minute we got to take a break here i got to have a little meeting here with bruce uh the moderately All agitated right. male boy uh uh now bruce i couldn't decide right off the bat if we were going to put this on the patreon channel or on the free channel but it's right. obvious that it's so so packed full of information this is jeff definitely quality free channel stuff Okay, so Which is, we need to uh, talk about our sponsor then, do we? Well, yeah, but it just so happens we happen to be. Did you know, George, we're actually do it, recording this in the Rapido Train studio? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was painted blue and yellow and everything. And uh, Rapido Trains is our sole exclusive sponsor of the AML free channel, the AML network. It is, a so, it is the only sponsor that the AML network has, the Modeler's Life has. And it's Rapido Trains, your fast track to model railroading exactly, fun. Exactly. It's Rapido Trains, your fast track. George, have you pre ordered your N scale Roar Turbo Liner yet? I have not, but I do have <laughs> some other locomotives, the HOGP38s and the U30Cs on uh, pre order. Non sound, of course, because I'll put in our Tsunami 2. Well, but exactly. that's one of the great things. That's one of the great things about Rapido. First of all, they're high quality models. I love the Rapido stuff. And number two is they do sell the non-sound options so that you can put Tsunami 2 or your brand of choice into the model so that you get actually the model you want instead of being force-fed something you don't. Exactly. Look, let, let, let's talk about that for me because I know Rapido will go out and do all sorts of recordings on a unit and under various conditions and things like that. Do, you, you, uh, you do the same thing for all your son loops, like say a... a uh, uh, an EMD 645 unit or something, you'll run it, uh, actually have a sound recording of the unit running, you know, idle under loads and doing all that stuff. Bruce, are you yes. looking at my notes? I was going to ask him about sound recording. <laughs> yeah, you have to, because a locomotive doesn't sound the same when it's sitting at idle and just running through the notches versus pulling a load. Um, right. But one of the things I will just kind of, you know, not necessarily throwing any, any stones at anybody, but um, we are very, very respectful of the equipment. Um, because these guys are, are letting us borrow and use the equipment. And so we are very cautious. We don't do anything that can damage the equipment or anything like that. Um, and so we, you know, we have recordings where we've actually pulled cars, uh, through, but we don't set any of the brakes on the cars to try to increase the load. Um, because then that flat spots, the wheels, and then it costs the, the museum or whoever the railroad extra money, because now they have to replace the wheels. Sounds um, like it sounds like you have a story about that that we you probably would prefer not to really. Wow, I'm not I'm not going to go into it, because, <laughs> but I've heard I've heard these stories come out. Um, I've also heard where, uh, and again, I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody. I, I I'm there the the companies that I've heard these are completely nameless. But I've also seen instances where uh, 
uh, companies are recording with a, mi- a field microphone walking next to a locomotive because they never got the the releases or the uh, information or the uh, what's the word I'm looking for releases or permission to be on the equipment and mic it up. And so what they have to do with those audio recordings is come back to the studio, hope they got everything that they wanted and then, you know, edit out the weed stomping or the birds and all that other stuff that, that potentially can be in there. Um, because when you're walking next to a locomotive, you can't get all of the throttle settings, especially if you're in notch eight, uh, pulling a cut of cars over, a, over a hill. Um, but we, we work very closely with a lot of our, our, you know, we have contacts all over the country. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, where we've signed releases, we've paid fees, uh, donations to be at the respective museums and things like that. And like I said, I mean, they're doing us a huge favor. And so we have no problem giving them donations. We have no problem being respectful of everything and, and trying to make sure that we leave everything the exact same way we got there. Um, because that way we can be invited back. And unfortunately, because of some of the um, actions of other companies, there's been some of those doors closed really? um, hmm. to all modelers. And so that's why that's why I don't want to get into it, because I don't want to sure, sound like no, I'm absolutely. Oh, names, yeah, yeah, but, absolutely. But, but those are some of the situations, and it's unfortunate that that kind of stuff happens. But, um, you know, and, and we go out there with state-of-the-art recording devices, and so we want to make sure we record multi-channel, and you know we record the actual locomotive. So is there somebody at Soundtracks that is kind of in charge of recording sounds, or is there like do, are you involved, or do you ha- or is there somebody that I, that's one of their jobs? Or um, the short answer is yes to all of it. Um, I have done a couple of the recordings that are actually on our Tsunami Twos now. Um, we have a couple of other recordings that I've done that are in the studio that I, because I don't have space, I don't have memory space to put it on, so I just have the raw audio. Uh, sitting in a file waiting for, you know, some next generation at some point or or maybe a redesign of the Tsunami 2 to give us some memory, you know, a little bit more memory space, whatever comes our way. Um, but uh, uh, there's no discussions on that right now. I'm just saying that that's, you know, there's there's some of those that have come up that way. Uh, so if you get our EMD decoder, the uh, 567 non-turbo with the non-transition at the, the very first prime mover on the list, that was a recording I did. Um, and I was so relieved when it turned out because as I mentioned earlier, I'm not an engineer. And so I was going on notes based on what our engineers were doing because I was doing a show in that particular region of the country where this particular locomotive was. And they had offered it to us at no cost. We just basically come out there and record it. So we did, we're obviously going to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and so when I did the recording, it took a while before these were ready to be edited, to be put into a decoder because we had started working on the tsunami two and started working on gathering a little bit more recordings, different variations, things like that. And so when I did that one, I was so nervous that it wasn't going to turn out and everything on that particular recording trip turned out except the air horn. And that was just because the air horn is so loud and my mic kept clipping, even though I kept turning the settings down and down, my mic kept clipping. And so they, they couldn't use it. So at some point, I do want to go back and get it because it was a Prime 990 air horn, which was used a lot on Mopac stuff. Um, but there's other recordings. I've done steam engines. We've blown up microphones depending on, you know, uh, where it is and what happens. There's all kinds of stories in that regard. But um there, you know, primarily we do it somewhat by committee, depending on where we are. Um, I've been there long enough, of course, with the experience, but we have had in the past and in the future uh, audio engineers that are dedicated to the audio. Okay. Uh, I got a question for you that you brought something up earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bruce, did I mention we're in the Rapido train studio? You did mention oh, that. Okay. The, blue and, the beautiful blue and yellow Rapido <laughs> Yeah, the beautiful, beautiful blue and yellow uh, Rapido trains. It's your fast track to model railroading fun. Um, that's cool that you got some of their stuff, George, but the question I have, and I think this is going to be a hard question for you to answer, but I'm interested to see if you think you have an answer. You talk about the nuts and bolts modelers, the guys that are really into the, you know, the, I don't know, the high end, the detail, the, the, I don't know how you'd describe it because I never really want to, you know, it's again, like what I use the hockey analogy, you know, Wayne Gretzky's a hockey player and so am I, we just, he's just way better at it than me. So, but sure. you you refer to them as the nuts and bolts guys, which is kind of a good, actually, a good way to to refer to people that are in their super detail, trying to reproduce the railroad as much as they can, blah blah blah. 
even wh- whether you're freelance or not, you're trying to produce things, trying to make it look. What do you think the percentage of the hobby is of these nuts and bolts gu- uh, guys and gals? Roughly. Ooh, yeah. that's yeah. a great question. Wow, that's two, George. Uh, that's two, George. <laughs> two, two great questions. Wow. We, we are not. Well, th- this one's going to require a little bit of thought. And and the reason I call them the nuts and bolts guys is because these are the guys that will call Atherin or call Rapido and say, hey, this handrail's off or this grab iron didn't exist here. You need to change the handrail to this type of. That's why that's who I'm qualifying as those people. Um, and those are very helpful people, by the way. I don't want to sound like I'm throwing them under the bus or the manufacturers like this guy again. No, those are those are very valuable. I know Atherin you know, values the response. Just make sure that they do it respectfully. And right. don't start off the conversation with you guys are idiots. Right. This is why. But anyway, I digress. Um, I would say probably, if I was guessing, probably about 20%. Oh, really? Okay. Um, I think I think the bulk of the modelers are kind of somewhere in between the novice, which I would say are probably the 20 to 30 percent, and that top 20 percent that are really counting the nuts and bolts. They just want a nice looking model that is fairly accurate and runs well. And here's kind of where I'll qualify myself. I don't necessarily put myself as the nuts and bolts guy, because if I have a good model, like say I model Missouri Pacific 1978, if I see Atherin makes a GP38 uh, model modeled in Mopac blue that looks re- rep- respectable, has pretty much most of the details, pretty accurate. I'm not going to worry about if that fans off by six inches. Um, I'm going to run the train. It's it's a very prototypical looking, and I'm trying to create the feel. Um, kind of going back to like Frank Ellison and his Delta lines. Remember, he did this article that was your model railroad is a, is a story. It's a scene in a movie. Your locomotives are the starring cast. Your cars, freight cars are the supporting cast. Your layout is the scene and moving cars around is the story you're telling. I, and I, I think the bulk of the modelers are the guys. That's me. Like I'm like the better the model, the like if it's a great model, but like you say, the fan six inches off. I don't care because it gives you the feel of what you're going for. Exactly. And that's why I think that's the big bulk of it. And that's why I give them probably the 50% of the modelers that are out there. Whereas I'll say beginners will go, you know, and I say the guys that are still learning because we're always getting new people in the hobby. I know everybody wants to say the hobby's dying. I disagree. Uh. As many people that I hear, (laughs) Hey, I just got back into model railroading. I'm always enthusiastic. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for doing that. You call me anytime you have any questions and I will help you out because I don't want you to be swayed by these, you know, the people no, the, you who, know what? Well, that, I don't have time for them. I'm so tired of that conversation and the hobby's dying. Bruce and I have had this yeah. conversation many times. That does not yeah. exist. That does not I, exist. It doesn't. And I think it's just changing and it's different. So we may not visibly see the modelers because there's not as many hobby shops. And I can go into a whole dissertation on why I think that is. And it's not because the hobby's dying. It's because the business model changing and the people that are running the stores tend to be former employees or business owners of something else. And they would think it would be fun to have a hobby shop and they don't know how to run the business. But like I said, I'll digress on that part. But if you go in and you look at the hobby's different. How many of these YouTube channels out there are people running trains? You never saw that. You, they're just they're out there. They're just different. They're they're seen differently. They may not go to the show because they can find all the news they want online. So they tend to be lone wolves, and that's where our younger generation of modelers are. Um, I know a lot of younger guys that don't necessarily go to the shows, but they do all the online stuff, and they'd rather send me an email than go to a show. And you, they you, may have in the fourteen years you've been there, you must have noticed. A shift in the age. I mean, like I agree with you 100. percent I think there is a tsunami of notice. Notice how I got no, that no, in. There. No pun intended. Yeah, well played. I, yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a tsunami of modelers coming that are between the ages of 15 and 35. That before social media never had the opportunity to intermingle with other modelers as easily as they do now. I think this hobby is just going to explode, and we're all going to be covered in model railroad goo because. <laughs> I, I don't think any. I don't think we have any idea of how big this hobby is. I, I think that's a very fair assessment, and and I, I've seen it. I have this. Uh, there's this one young kid that I talk to. He calls almost every Friday after school and asks questions about tsunami decoders and how to program this or how to do this. And I'll talk to him sometimes for 20, 30 minutes because that's the young, it's the youth, and it's enthusiastic. And when I did the narrow gauge convention up in. Uh, uh, Tacoma, Washington, that wasn't far from where he's at. And I went up there and I said, Hey, I'm coming to town 
bring you and your parents and tell me where we'll meet. We'll rail fan together for an hour. And we did. And by God, his parents were there. We met and they, they are fantastic people. They support him. His dad was like this. I don't care anything about it, but he loves it. We're going to support everything for him as long as the schoolwork is done. And I said, thank you. And I applauded him for that. We had a great afternoon. We watched a bunch of trains and, um, and then there was another another young kid who I met him the first time. He was 16, and he came to a narrow gauge convention coincidentally up in Minnesota. I'm still great friends with him today. He's uh, probably 18, 19, 20, somewhere in that age now, and he's actually working at a barbecue restaurant. And I'm so proud of him because that's one of his other passions, model trains and barbecue. And I said, follow your passion. You're never going to work again in your life. And, and you know, I saw him again at the national show because his parents support him in this hobby as well. So they take him to a lot of these national national show. So they came down to uh, Milwaukee for train fest and that was about a four hour drive for him. So uh, this was the first time I met his mother. Um, so I see them out there, but I don't know how many people pay attention to them because I think a lot of people maybe dismiss them as just a young kid that's coming to see the little trains running around and the toy trains and they're not giving them maybe the credit they deserve. Um, and so I do everything I can to encourage them because I think those kids are great. And I think, you know, the more we encourage them in the hobby, the better they are. And it's infectious. They have friends. I mean, a couple of the kids oh, uh, that yeah. I'm talking to have friends that are starting to get interested because of their interest. I think um, that's what I think that's what's going to yeah. happen to the hobby. It's going to become more and more mainstream because it's already way bigger than we think. And all everybody's becoming connected. And and there's something about if you're a, and. Our buddy, uh, Uncle Dave Abley's, he, and who else? Were, I was listening to somebody else. I was do, I was listening to an interview. I don't remember who it was, but it was obvi- It was on a podcast. It was sponsored by Rapido Trains, oddly enough. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but we talk about how model railroading and rail fanning, it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's becoming a lifestyle. Like it's, it's the people that are model railroaders and rail fans are, they're one in a, one in the same. I mean, they're all becoming, you know, they're, they're all connected now. It's easy to, I have friends. Look at you and I, George. I mean, we've become friends. We talk about hockey. We, and it's all because we had this common, common interest. Absolutely. It's improving. It's just improving the general overall value of and kind life. Of to, and kind of to speak to that. I mean, think of this. So you, we have virtual rail fan which is a webcam yep. service that you can go watch trains all over the country. And if you think the hobby's dying, I say, go watch the roundups because they'll do focus shots on the kids holding the signs. We love VR uh, virtual rail fan. I mean, it, they're not, they're not going away. It's just changing. And so it may be different. Um, you mentioned the age of the hobbyist and I think this makes perfect sense because our, our hobbyists and the active modelers tend to be older. And part of the reason is because when you're younger, you're raising a family, you're making a career, you're spending a lot of time on that. And so you don't always have time for yourself. But once the kids are grown and gone, now you have time for your hobbies, which is model trains. And so now you can act on that desire that you've had. I mean, you know, through my life, I've unfortunately not had any kids. Um, and I have a career where I basically am a model railroader for life. Um, And so it gives me a different opportunity, but I see all this and, you know, I see a lot of guys, Hey, I've recently retired. I'm I'm now have a lot of time. I'm getting back into trains. Tell me what I need. Um, as much as I hate to say it, but this, uh, this, a virus that was going around the last few years has been a boon for the model railroad hobby um, because people were stuck at home with nothing else to do. I've talked to hob- uh, to uh, uh, retail stores all over the country that said they have an influx of new modelers because they were looking for something to do. And so they went to the hobby store and found trains and they buy trains and they're still there coming there today. And I, and like I've, I've people have heard me say, and I'm sure George, you've listened to all the podcasts and some of them twice, but I, of course. I yeah. But I say sponsored by Rapido Trains. There you go. Now we're getting there. We George, our Bruce, you and I have to learn how to do that. Yes, we got to get we're into getting, that rhythm. We're getting somewhat better. Yeah, we we didn't we didn't we we need to do a little blurb for the start of this one. Yes, because we, can do that. we yeah we completely blew it. But uh, where was I going to say? We were remember. talking about the change of the the age of the hobbyist and the age of the, our family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you were saying about the pandemic. And I, I, me personally, I think the fire was already there and and the pandemic just threw gasoline on it and just made uh, it. Uh, agreed. I, obviously, I agree with that. They were, you know, there were some that were looking for a new hobby, but it gave them that excuse uh, to 
because there was no bars, there were no sports, there were no movies, there was nothing else to do. So they, well, let's start acting on this now. And I mean, it was a boon. We've seen a massive in, increase in sales over the last two and a half years, you know, and I hate to say it because of what the rest of the world went through, but we actually had a great, you know, last two and a half years because people were home and they were working on their projects. All right. I, I, we got time for just two more. I'm going to give you a chance and not, not a big chance, a little chance. I'm going to give you a chance to plug the new blue Nami and tell us a little bit yes. about that. Yes. So blue Nami. And I did mean that was actually going to be part two of my response to your DCC question. Is, <laughs> and I, star- I started it, but we got sidetracked. So when you're talking about uh, your DCC systems, pushing all these buttons to access the higher functions, we now have uh, blue Nami, which is a app based Bluetooth connection direct to the decoder. It's not going through the track. It's not, uh, you know, talking to your DCC system or anything. It's talking direct to the decoder. The decoder has its own antenna and is receiving the Bluetooth signal. And you control that decoder direct from your app on your phone. It is a touch screen. Um, and you have a throttle, you know, that you can slide the bar up and down and go fast or slower. You push the button, change directions. But there's a side menu that you can pull out and you can leave it out because it doesn't cover the throttle or direction switch where you have access to the first 14 functions right there on your screen. And then if you want to access 15 to 28, you just push the little button next to and it changes to 15 to 28. And you can rename them. You can remap anything. So instead of seeing a lighting effect as FX3, you can actually rename it as number boards or ditch lights or whatever you want it to be. Um, But this is really revolutionized. uh, Um. DCC in general, because it's still a DCC based product and we do still have the NMRA DCC conformance warrant for Blue Nami. So it runs on DCC. So if you hook it up to your DCC equipped locomotives and run them on the layout, you'll never know the difference. When you run it separately or with other Blue Nami decoders, consisting is a breeze. You open up the app, you connect to the decoder, and once you're connected, the decoder then ignores the DCC track commands, only listens to the app, and then you can consist it with other locomotives. And the best part is the app is talking to those locomotives. So you don't have to worry about limitations based on how the DCC signal is being sent or if there's all this other traffic because everybody else has consist. Um, the decoders using the track power strictly for track power. And it's doing everything based on the app. Um, so those guys that have held out uh, being DC modelers saying, wow, DCC is too complicated. You just hit the jackpot because this is going to make it where your DC layout can now run equivalent of a DCC locomotive. Oh, really? Okay. So I didn't oh, cool. fully, wow. I didn't fully understand that. So, uh, here, here, yeah. Okay. Now a question you talked about consist. Uh, can you consist a blue Nami locomotive that, uh, just straight, uh, uh, you know, like tsunami two locomotive. Can you consist? You uh, so if you have three locomotives, two tsunami twos and a blue Nami, can you re- re- work them together? Using the DCC protocol. Yes. Okay. You won't be able to talk to the Tsunami 2 through the Blue Nami app because right. that's a direct connection and there's no re- there's no receiver. Yeah, but but if you got Tsunami a concept set and your lead loco is on Blue Nami, it will still control the other two. Yes? No. Well, again, if you're if you're on DCC, yes. Yes. Okay. Because right. it just runs as a normal DCC decoder. So when yeah. you're on the DCC track and you concept with other Tsunami 2, it's going to run just like a Tsunami 2. You'll never know the div- you'll never know okay. it's a Blue Nami. But, but it's only but. when you but it's the, only when you connect to it from yeah, the app. But the difference is if you have a DC layout and you install one of these in a locomotive, you can now run uh, a, your locomotive as if it was a DCC system. And you, if you yep. had two locomotives, you could stick them together and run them yep. on a DC layout, which yep. is pretty cool. How do you, when did, when did this, when was this released, the Blue Nami? Uh, this, this past summer was when we actually released it. Um, we've been working on it for a couple of years. Um, and there's a lot of, of stuff going along, uh, legal things. Uh, for example, the word Bluetooth, you have to pay certain fees, uh, to be able to use the word Bluetooth on your advertising campaigns. I mean, I can tell you it works on Bluetooth, but if you'll notice our packaging, it doesn't say Bluetooth. It says wireless, um, because the use of the word Bluetooth on your packaging and advertising is stupid high and we're not multimillionaires so we don't pay that extra bit but it is a and that's why the blue the blue nami logo is looks like the bluetooth logo but it's not yeah see that's why all of um, the, that's why all of our podcasts are only on cassette yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Sponsored by Rapido Trains. Exactly. There you <laughs> go. Boy, yeah. Your fast track to model roading fun. There you go. There you go. Uh, but, um, um, but the blue we're talking to a train professional with us. Yeah, I know we are. I know. <laughs> Watching George at a show is like uh, it's like entertainment. You can stand back, you know, a couple of booths back. He's actually not that far away from our booth in. Uh, <laughs> You can see he's, he's, he's like a little uh, underhand toss away from where we're at. Yeah, Springfield. you're about a nine iron from us, George, because we now have uh, our the podcast now has the City Classics booth. Oh, okay. And so we're in yep. the same place. We're in that same spot because we became friends with Jim Sacco of City Classics, and that's where the AML Nation hung out. And then I talked to John Sacerdoti, and we were able to obtain the same area for the podcast. So we'll be we're nice. just we're just like a half a nine iron away from you. You're down one That's wall awesome. and we're down the other wall. Yep. Uh, and I saw the meetups. I saw the meetups the last couple of times I was out there, but I, those shows are so busy. I do not have time to come over and see you guys. And you said, you said it yourself. You see, there's usually a crowd of people, especially that show waiting around. And so the mere fact that I can even shake somebody's hand and say, hello, it's, that's an amazing yeah. uh, thing. And I love it. I'm, uh, I'm not taking uh, this time. I'm keeping the Dallas stars hat. <laughs> yes i'm gonna get i'll get you something i'll get you something this year <laughs> um so here's my last thing that i wanted to talk about uh and then we'll call it a day it's uh so uh i know you're how many you've played hundreds of hockey games now you've how many years have you been you've been playing 14 years in durango and mm -hmm. and how many years before you got to durango were you playing i was ice hockey I want to say I've picked it up somewhere around 98, 99. Okay. So uh, actually, I take that back. I, it was right, somewhere around there, 98, 99, maybe 2000, um, because um, I had barely started it when I divorced my first wife. And we were actually going to the courtroom to file the divorce on September 11th, 2001. And needless to say, the courtroom was closed. Um, we just should have never been married. So we decided, well, courtroom's closed. We're both off of work. We went and had lunch together and then went back to work. Um, <laughs> we just shouldn't have been married. <laughs> um, but so, I mean, we're, and I'm still friends with her today, but anyway, that's about when I took off. Cause up until then I had played indoor soccer and, and then soccer through high school, uh, on the field and running. And, and in my junior year, I blew up my ankle and tore all kinds of ligaments and then never really recovered to play soccer at the, um, varsity level. Um, because it, when I came back from the injury, they had, he had players and he was like, Oh, go over there and play pass with the subs. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I was your starter last year. Don't you want to get me back? And, but anyway, um, so that's about, so after, after high school, I started playing indoor soccer with some of the guys from college and some other people I knew. Um, and then I blew up my shoulder. Um, and then I took a few years off of sports and then, like I told you, we took up, uh, some sticks there. So it was somewhere around 98, All 99. Right. So the um, short, the short answer would be just over 20 years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, remind Sorry. me, remind me, Bruce. <laughs> Remind me to write on the whiteboard, Bruce. Never do a podcast with George and Dave in the same room. Oh, well, that, that'd be entertaining. <laughs> that'd be like a uh, nuclear. Uh, I'm that, sorry. That'd be like Fermi Fer doing his original test under the stadium in Chicago. There. Exactly. So the, I'm the, sorry. The, I like to explain things. Yeah, I know. And the uh, the the reason I wanted to ask you is uh, lately the NHL and it's and I know you guys. I know you goalie types. Why are you guys knocking the nets off the off the off the post what is this deal lately with all you guys knocking the nets out and then so there there's a couple of factors number one it's a, a save selection style called reverse vh and reverse vh when taught properly back in like 2010 somewhere around there was when jonathan quick adapted it from mike valley and Mike Valley was a goalie coach. He was with the stars, but quick really made it mainstream. But what it does is used to be on a, on a near post save, you would put your leg near the post vertical. So your leg pad would be up next to the post. And then your other leg would be kind of squared and flat on the ice to create a, a surface where the pads would intersect at the knee and the heat and the ankle. And then your body was upright to protect a lot of the top of the net. But in that particular save selection, you're kind of immobile. You're kind of stuck there. So if the play quickly moves out to the front, up to the top of the slot, you're kind of, you're kind of awkward to move out of that position to get up and get back into the ready, ready for the next potential shot. So they invented what's called a reverse VH. And the reverse VH takes your leg near the post down to the ice 
And when taught properly, your ankle is against the post. And so that way your body can be more upright. And then your far leg from the post is up kind of pushing into the ice a little bit to make sure you're up against the post properly. So if something hits or let's say the puck drops and they go to, you know, poke at it, your weak leg against there doesn't open up and allow the the goal. So that's the, the basis of the save. And it's only supposed to be played and goalies overuse it. In my opinion, I've, I've even caught myself doing it, overplaying it. When you, the, when the puck is out below the face-off circles between the face-off circles and the goal line is when that position is supposed to be taken because you block pretty much everything except next to your ears. And from that angle to pick your ears off, that's a hell of a shot. He's going to score anyway. But what happens is, is as the play develops and it comes down towards the corners, the goalie, because our legs are so much stronger than goalies of the 70s and 80s, the play develops so fast, they drop and then kick and push themselves up against that post. And so when their leg hits the post, that rubber uh, post uh, uh, stud or whatever you want to call it that drops into the ice and up into the bar gives a little bit but it's designed to give so that if the player coming in at full speed hits it, he's not going to break his arm or his leg because the post is going to give and the player can use that to slow his momentum before he hits the end boards. So what happens is. So why are you knocking the net off the, off the post? Because you guys are just like recently, it's just, everybody's knocking the nets off and just enough with the explanations. Just stop doing it. Well, the second part is they also, from that position, use their in, their leg against the post like a flipper to kick themselves off of that post to get back up to the top center of the, of the crease to make the save. And that's usually where you'll see it pop off. Well, Matt Murray's now, gonna, Matt Murray's going to get himself in a, in a world of hurt because he's obviously pushing it off with his shoulder. They, they almost got him in. They almost got him in New Jersey because, like, twice or three times he pushed the net off with his shoulder. They're going to get him for that. They're going to get him. And that may be an angling, you know, strength thing, but I'll tell you oh, real quick. Come on. You guys are just knocking the nets off because you see the play starting to wind up and you get, you're get, yeah, I'm like, no, I'll just knock the net off. <laughs> now, yeah, I, I, then, then, then in the Leafs game the other night, though, the net was off on the one and then they still playing like 14 or 15 I, I seconds. Know, and that's exactly. The goalie's going, hey, hey, the net here, the net here, the yeah. play's still going on. All and right. that'll depend on who, who has possession, but I'll tell you a funny story real quick. And I've used this before. <laughs> Um, you talk about intentionally knocking the net off. If I, as a goalie, turn and intentionally knock the net off, it's supposed to be a two-minute delay of game. So I heard this story years ago. There was a, It was one of these goalie roundtable things I was reading where the goalie was saying he turned around and somehow had a two-on-o. And um, so to restore so, – so what he did is he turned and pushed the net off the, off the moorings. And the play was whistled dead, but because it was a two-on-o – they awarded a penalty shot. And he said, I've got my chances better with a one-on-one versus a two-on-o. Sure. So he yeah. intentionally turned and did it. And so I did that during a game. And and I was thinking that's exactly what they're going to do. Well, they they didn't call anything on me. They didn't even award a penalty shot. And they drew a face-off circle. Or they did a face-off next to me. And the other team was pissed. And I said, look, I thought they were going to give you a penalty shot. <laughs> I told him, I said, look, I thought they were going to give you a penalty shot and I got a better chance of one on O than two on O. <laughs> and, th- and that's the story, Bruce. And he's sticking to it. Well, yeah, yep. it's, it's a good story. Yeah, hey, exactly. Don't yell at me, yell at the referee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, and there, and so I didn't, I, I apologized to him cause I thought they were going to give him more, but, and I haven't done it since. <laughs> you apologized. I, never, I did. I, I'm sure you did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Bruce, I, I can't decide if this is going to be a was happening or this thing sounds like an episode. Almost, this, this, but, this is an episode. I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. It well, is. I had fun. So whatever you guys decided oh, we had a with blast. it, I enjoyed it's been it. a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it will be whatever we decide. Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, no matter what you think, what Lionel thinks trumps it. Yeah, there exactly. You go. This so is there's a, a t- reason he's called the evil overlord. There you go. Exactly. Uh, this is a tough call, Bruce. Um, so you're thinking an episode, eh? I'm thinking an episode, man. We've got we've got quality material here to fill an episode. All right. Well, we'll make it, a, and, which means it'll be aired the first Monday in February. There Feb- we go. February. February. Today is February. Sorry. February. February. <laughs> it'll be it'll be it'll be the first Monday after Springfield that this is on. There oh, you there go. We go. 
There you go. So uh, let's see what's the date of that. That's like, uh, I'm going to look on the big board here. That'll be uh, February the, uh, Jan yeah, February the 6th is when this will be aired. There you okay. go. Tom Schmieder's going to be mad at you. Could, or no, Eric, no, you know who's going to be annoyed at you the most is going to be Eric White. You bumped him by two weeks. Ooh. Uh -oh. The editor of Model Railroader. So you got to be careful there. Ooh. Ah, uh, there we go. Um, That's okay. We we pay our advertising bills, so he'll forgive me. There you go. <laughs> Well, as a matter of fact, so does Rapido Train. So we're all, everything's set. There you go, Rapido you Train. Go. Your fast track to model road would be fun. <laughs> I gave, uh, yeah, well, I'll we'll talk about that later. I told Jason, I said, I said, you got to give me a chance to get used to doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So that's it. Bruce, can you give out our email address? Yes, our email address. Please uh, send us your emails. Uh, we'd love to read your comments, all the comments. We look at them all. Send them to us at modlerslife at gmail.com. That modeler with one L, modlerslife at gmail.com. And uh, if you didn't catch that email address, if you go to our website, amodelerslife.com, and just scroll down to a picture of the moderately agitated male boy in a particularly agitated state, uh, boom, you just click on the picture and the email is already filled, the address is already filled in for you. You just got to put in your subject line and your text and you're ready to go. Um, Indeed, what could be easier? Exactly. Um, and by the way, speaking of, um, uh, of that, uh, George, have you ever wanted a t-shirt with a hot dog on it? Uh, not necessarily, but I do have two Modeler's Life t-shirts that I do wear regularly. Attaboy. Well, then we've got to get you some more, I guess. Um, and anyway. I love that Chiefs jersey, by the way. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're but 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 let, let, let's search, let, let's play along, George. If you did want a T-shirt with a hot dog, and how do you think you might get one? Yeah, um, I'd probably go to modelerslife dot com. No, you'd go to uh, yeah, you go, you actually go to Midwest Model Railroad, which is one of your favorite oh. stores. Oh yeah, they're great. They're great uh, support of our product. They carry a lot of it. Yep, and you click on uh, their URL is Midwest Model RR. And dot com, and then you go across the navigation bar all the way to the right and click on AML, and boom, you are in a wonderland of hats, hoodies, T-shirts, mugs, whatever you could possibly need is right there. And yes. in there is a T-shirt with a hot dog on it. That's a fun store. I, I got to be there a couple summers ago, and Steve runs a great ship, and they were expanding at the time. I haven't been since the new expansion, but they've got a big, nice, beautiful store out there. They're 15,000 square feet. It's like walking through a real-life Walther's catalog. <laughs> Pretty much. That would be a great assessment. <laughs> it really is. It's just, it's great. Uh, and that's it. I think we've covered it all. Have we not? Uh, email address, website. Oh, what about uh, if somebody wants to get more than just the free stuff? Oh, yeah. And George, if uh, this will be on the free channel, but uh, every Tuesday, let's just say that on the if you click on Patreon, you'll get all the information you need uh, for how to uh, get uh, two podcasts a week. The second one on gotcha. Tuesday, the one on Tuesday is part of our Patreon, and that's uh, that's a pay per view, I guess, is what that is. A eh? pay per here, pay per here, pay per L, pay per listen. Yeah. There you, you go. Know. All right, and then I'll I'll throw a little plug um, for anything you need about soundtracks. Uh, soundtracks dot com. We have a lot of great products, information, manuals. Everything explains everything, including Chapter One, which, like I said, they're hard to write, hard to read sometimes. But chapter one will tell you all the cool things the decoder can do. Then the rest of the chapters explain how to do that. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, uh, Soundtracks DCC. You just search soundtracks and then a, usually a topic that you want to hear a video on. We've been doing uh, weekly videos on there for four years now. Um, so there's plenty of topics on there. We've even got a webinar series where we walk you through everything, including what is DCC and how does it work, uh, all the way up to technical discussions like we talked about today with the uh, PWM signals. Um, there's even stuff that's not necessarily soundtracks related, such as decoder installation overview. There's a soldering class. Um, there's even one that teaches you how to use the three main DCC systems, because like we talked about, uh, if you don't know how to use the DCC system, you're not going to be able to get the most out of the decoder. So we give you a tutorial on MRC, Digitrax, and NCE. Um, where that doesn't really benefit us per se directly, but if you know how to use your command station. So we're all about knowledge. We want to help you out. Um, and then, and then last, if, if you have any questions, I'm an email away, George B that's G E O R G E the letter B at soundtracks.com. And that's S O U N D T R A X X.com. Yeah, and and I'll be happy to help any, any answer anything I can for you. 
And if you're ever at a train show, if you're whatever train show you're at, you see uh, the soundtracks booth and George is there. Do not, I repeat, do not be afraid to walk up and uh, approach George and ask questions because he's extremely, uh, you're an extremely, you're an ambassador to the hobby is what you are. You're a, you're a great representative for soundtracks, but you're also a great ambassador for the hobby. So don't be afraid to to walk up to George and introduce yourself because he'd be glad to meet you. Absolutely. And it's soundtracks.com is uh, where you can go. You go to soundtracks.com. It's a great website. It's well laid out. You can find out everything you want to know about. About, like you say, it's not just I'm I'm looking at the page, the support, and it's like there's CV programming, decoder installs. There's all kinds of soldering class, DCC operation. There's tons of information there. You mm-hmm. guys, That's there's- one of the things about soundtracks is you guys have been very much about the hobby. Yes, you're selling your product. There's no doubt about that. But you're very mm-hmm. much about supporting the hobby. Absolutely. We're hobbyists, I mean, at heart. I mean, the first, the, the two company owners met uh, because he was interested in model trains. She was a marketing person and he wanted her to help sell the product so she or he plopped down a a k36 on her desk and brass fujiyama model and she said that's the coolest thing i've ever seen and partnership was made yeah so we're hobbyists at heart it's a great company and it's great people so um and i feel like you and i our friendship is a classic example of how the new world is creating the is making the hobby grow like crazy because you know like i say many a times i'll be at a leaf game and i'll be texting you and telling about it and we have it's just a, it's a, it's a great company and it's great people in it. Great. Well, thank you very much. And we do our best. And like I said, we're easily accessible again, come up, just introduce yourself if nothing else. Hey, I heard you on AML, you know, great conversation. We'd love right. to hear it. All right. So now at the appropriate moment, George, you're going to have to say happy rails to you. Okay. All right. Well, George, as we close the barn and it's key, there's something else I have to tell you. There's no singing. There's no dancing. There's no interpretation. It's just happy rails to you with enth- okay. with enthusiasm, of course. Of course. Well, George, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say happy rails to you. Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumba Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.